Hello Church, it's Lord's Day, December 6, 2020. I want to extend a warm welcome to all of you who are able to join us in this time of worship. On December 21st through 23rd, that's Monday through Wednesday, Higher Calling will be hosting a Winter Youth Conference entitled Steadfast. Early registration is $20. I encourage all of you to uh, come and to listen to great speakers, uh, worship, and there will be plenary sessions and workshops as well. A time of just enriching uh, ourselves with God's Word. I know online worship can feel very Im remote and impersonal. Everything worship should not be. When faced with the challenges of our world, it is more urgent for us today to come to God with our eyes focused on Him uh, and set on Him by faith. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for and certain of the things unseen. Our world experience tells us worship is disconnected and distant. Our eyes of faith tells us we are united with God. We are united with all of God's people, past, present, and future, with all of the heavenly hosts. We are gathered before God in worship, worship of our one and only true God. That is the, God, that is the gift that God bestows upon us through His Son. And that is the gift that God now calls us to worship. Hear now His call. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. Amen.
<laughs> Our scripture reading comes from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 through 32, and chapter 6, verses 13 through 15. Hear now God's word. Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do, in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have become themselves up to, um, given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learn Christ, assuming that you have heard about Him and were taught in Him as the truth is in Jesus. To put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God, in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of, an, one of another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths but only such is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand the evil day, and, had, and having done all, to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth. Amen. God's holy word. Let us go to God in prayer. Blessed Heavenly Father, we give you praise for who you are and what you have done for us in sending your Son into darkness and resting us by the light of the gospel. We leave each day so oblivious to the cosmic spiritual warfare being waged in our lives. We are overcome in our thoughts by worries about health, livelihood, and future. We long for things outside of your good purpose to experience pain, grief, and sorrow. Grant us your mercy and grace as we meditate upon your words this morning that the truth of the gospel may be apparent, that it may be received with gladness and faith, that it may transform and strengthen us to live in the fullness of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, there are a few things as tragic as child abduction. For Alicia Kozakowicz, her nightmare started at the age of 13, when she innocently struck, uh, snuck out of her home to meet a person she met online. A person she thought was a friend. A person uh, who she thought was the same age as her, who shared all of her interests. Deceived and abducted by a child predator, Alicia was chained, starved, and endured four days of brutal nightmare. Just 40 minutes before she was to be taken away and murdered, she was rescued by FBI agents who through a tip tracked her down. You know, although young people today in light of unsupervised distance learning, are faced with unprecedented dangers, online dangers. Christians have always faced a predator that would deceive and abduct us from the comforts and safety 
of our Heavenly Father. In the letter of Ephesians, Paul first writes about all the comforts and blessings the church has as people who have been rescued and adopted into God's family. Paul then warns the church that they are in a state of war, that they are to fight against the devil, the enemy of God, and the church. An enemy who uses deception to abduct and torment the church and individual Christians. Now, I know some of you are still out there thinking spiritual warfare, that all seems so out of the world, so superstitious, not really relevant to my life, to my real life struggles at work, school, family, my real emotional, physical, and social and life struggles. It seems very distant. It seems to be dealing with the superstition and not really relevant to my life. You know, let me ask you, would a Christian who is vigilant and standing firm in God's truth of the gospel and God's will and purpose for our lives, a Christian who is foremost committed to a life obedience, do you think that such a person would be deceived by a stranger to go lie to their family and sneak out of the house? Do you think a vigilant Christian will easily and routinely give in to lying or cheating on their loved ones? Do you think a person who understands that he or she is in a state of war will easily give in to the enemy's lies to turn away from one's family and God for money, power, success, fame, and acceptance? Do you think a person who is ready and willing to follow his or her Savior will easily forsake the truth, the gospel of salvation, for lofty, academic, and Christless expositions, filled with man's opinions, moral finger-pointing, or unbiblical promises of a good life, no matter what? Tragically, we see it all too often. In 1 John, we are told that in our fallen sinful nature, we tend to have overwhelming desires of the flesh, desires of the riches of this world, and sinful pride, which makes us super vulnerable to the enemy's attacks. If you recall, Satan attacked Jesus the same way he attacked Eve, by focusing on those three areas. Jesus completely demolishes Satan's temptations. But like Eve, we are so susceptible. We are super vulnerable to the enemy's attacks. That is why Paul uses the strongest language to tell the church that we are in a state of war and that we must stand against the enemy by putting on the full armor of God, to be ready and willing to distrust to trust and obey our Savior. It is in trusting and the readiness to obey God in everything. I mean everything. Nothing is kept from God. It is in trusting and, uh, and the readiness to obey our Savior that we are, re that we are to put on the full arm of God, to fight against the enemy. If we are not trusting or ready to obey God in all things, we cannot say we have put on the full armor of God and that we are ready to stand against our enemy. So point one, put on the full armor of God by trusting in God's word and being completely ready and committed to obey God in all things. If you are unsure about God's promises, going back and forth on whose word, opinions, and uh, arguments, thoughts, ideas, or values are more important, then you are not putting on the full armor of God. If you are saying to God, yes, I think I believe in you, and I think I appreciate all that you have done for me. Yes, I am willing to give up this and this in my life, but in this area, in the area of my future, in the area of my music, in the area of my 
computer games, in the area of the choice of who I want to hang around with, in the area of what really is going to make me happy, I'm not really ready to give those up for you. If that's you, then you are not putting on the full armor of God. You face the enemy completely defenseless. It's like going to a room full of COVID patients without a single personal protection equipment. Yet you are completely exposed to all the lies and schemes of a powerful supernatural being who would infect you and destroy you. You are easy picking. So ask yourself, do I understand who I am in this state of war? As a church, we have to ask ourselves, do we as a church understand we are in a state of war? And as a church, we are, uh, and as a church, are we completely ready and willing to trust and obey our Lord and Savior in all things without any compromise or exceptions? Once we have this readiness to fight against the enemy and the willingness to take on the full armor of God, we are told we are to fasten, to gird on the belt of truth. Basically, we are told to first fill our lives with truth. You know, I know that truth can be one of those topics that you can spend a lifetime trying to define and decipher its meaning. In fact, Pontius Pilate, at his peak, responded to Jesus by asking, What is truth? So what is this truth that we, the Church of Christ, and as we, in, as individual Christians, should fill our lives with? The truth we are to fill our lives with is simple. It's one, the gospel, and two, holiness. In order to stand against the enemy, we are to take up on the full armor of God by filling our lives with the gospel of salvation. Paul reminds the church that they were made a new creation by the truth that is in the gospel of Jesus. That's what verse 20 and 21 means when Paul says, But that is not the way you learn Christ, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. The truth that is in Jesus. Truth is in Jesus, the gospel of Jesus Christ. When taught, heard, and learned, and transforms, it transforms sinners who were hostile to God and he transforms sinners who are, who are hostile to God into His beloved uh, children, a new and holy people, His church. In Ephesians 1.13, Paul writes, In Him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in the Spirit, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. Here Paul defines truth as the gospel of salvation. In fact, we see in all of Paul's writing, truth is the whole counsel of God, the mystery of salvation revealed and made clear in the gospel of Jesus Christ, in the good news of all the riches that God has poured upon our lives at the cost of His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior. In the gospel, we are given all of God's revealed truth that saves us and enables us to resist all of the enemy's temptations and accusations. When talking about the spiritual gifts of pastors, people engaged in teaching and preaching God's word, Paul in, in Ephesians 4.15 says, Speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into Him who is the head, into Christ. Paul is essentially saying ministers are to preach the truth in love. They are to preach the gospel. In Galatians 1.8, Paul is more direct when he says, But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. Ministers are to proclaim the truth. They are to proclaim the gospel, the good news of all that God has done for us, at the, Christ of his, at the price of His Son. 
the good news of Jesus, the sum total of, of all of the Old Testament and the New Testament is a sure foundation for the church. Anyone who preaches opinions about God's word but does not preach Christ does not preach the gospel. That person is leading the church in a very dangerous direction. John in his letters clearly warns the church that the greatest danger it faces is false teaching, teaching that contradicts the gospel. The Bible in its entirety is a book about, about God's work of saving sinners and restoring them to an everlasting life with Him through a wonderful mediator and savior, Jesus, fully man and fully God. So what does it mean to be filled with the gospel of Jesus? It is to reject any teaching that does not proclaim Christ. It is to embrace only teachings that proclaim and manifest Christ. In the past nine months now, online sermons have boomed. It's everywhere. The choices are boundless. When you listen to any sermon, you must ask yourself, is Jesus proclaimed? What did I learn about Jesus? What did I learn about the good news of all that God has done for me and the life He has blessed me with at the cost of Christ? How does this message reveal, make real to me who Jesus is, what He has accomplished for me, and my new identity as God's child? Does this sermon celebrate and highlight, does it lift up Jesus? If a sermon does not lift up Jesus, then it is not a message from God. It is not the truth, it is the deceitful schemes of the enemy. So beware, do not be deceived and be abducted by the enemy. <clears throat> In order to stand against the enemy, we take on the full armor of God by filling our lives with holiness. In verse 23, the church is to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. You know, one of the riches we have through the gospel is that we have to make new creatures. In Ephesians 4, verses 17 through 27, Paul tells the church that they should not conduct themselves like non-believers who are alienated from God. Uh, non-believers who are part of their old self, ignorant to the truth, hearts hardened against God, callous, totally given over to physical pleasures, you know, making sex, romance, friendships, food, drinking, substances, working out, sports, adventures and thrills, wellness, happiness, the ultimate is, is to make these things the ultimate thing, living for these things rather than living for God. It is in God that we can truly enjoy all these things rightly. The church must not make worldly pleasures, fulfilling the felt needs of its members, its ultimate reason for existing. The church is not to be greedy in impure words, lie, live corrupt lies, be filled with anger, stealing, dishonest, cheating, corrupt talking, bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, slander, and malice. Rather, the church must conduct themselves in holiness, in the reality of the new self, their new identity as God's people, God's family, God's children, the body of Jesus Christ. The church is the body of Jesus Christ. This means our, our identity is found in Jesus. Just as Jesus is, is accepted as sinless and perfectly righteous, we too, in Jesus, stand before the Father, sinless, all of our sins forgiven and made righteous. Through Jesus, we are made holy, separate, distinguished, set aside as God's very special people, as God's children, as God's family. As such, Paul writes the church is to speak the truth with his neighbor, having loving concerns for fellow brothers and sisters, being engaged in honest work, being engaged in talk that is good for building up and give grace to those who hear, to be kind, tender-hearted, and forgiving one another, and have righteous passions. 
right passions. Righteous passions means being completely smitten by God, just head over heels in love with God, to trust after God, and to lust after God, to have overflowing, out of control desire for God. That is what it is. Uh, that it what it means to be angry and to not sin. If our passions are not centered on God, then our then it is centered on something else, and we give the devil opportunity. The Greek word for opportunity is topos, translated as space, room, territory, or dwelling. A place uh, given for someone to live and to operate. Whenever our passions are out of place, whenever we forget our holy identity in Christ, whenever we feel fail to live as holy and righteous people, as new creatures made new in Christ, we give the devil territory, space, dwelling in our lives to further deceive us. We lose ground to the enemy only to have our ministry, our work, our witness for Christ, our fellowship in church, our marriage relationships, our relationship with our parents, our relationship with our children, our work, our studies, God's purpose for our lives, all of these are undermined, hijacked, and kidnapped by the enemy. One of the powerful reasons people are filled with disappointment and bitterness anger and malice against the church is that they have been hurt by other Christians. They see other Christians and prominent leaders fall in sin, live double standard lives, living as holy people only in word, but in their conduct are wretched sinners, liars, and cheats. If we're really honest with ourselves, we have given territory after territory to Satan in our lives. Our witness for Christ is so marred, so handicapped by our hypocrisy. Is there any hope? We are told yes. Our only hope is to gird ourselves with the belt of truth, the truth of the gospel, the truth of our true identity in Christ. Yes, we are sinners, but only in in church can sinners find forgiveness and healing through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Church is a place where sinners can encounter Christ through the gospel, enabling us to experience God's overwhelming love and forgiveness. Only in Christ can we find forgiveness for our constant, repetitive sins that grieve us so. In Christ, we are able to forgive not only ourselves, but others. We can have healing in our lives. We can humbly confess our sins ask for forgiveness, and receive healing and restoration we so desperately need. And as we repent and experience God's forgiveness in Jesus, Satan's hold and accusation against us weakens. The church becomes a place where we can freely admit one's sin only to highlight and celebrate the love and mercy of God in Christ Jesus. Church is a place where sinners who are in a desperate need of a wonderful and gracious Savior find healing, comfort, reassurance, and desire, the fuel to live more and more, little by little, a life of holiness, a life of honesty, tenderness, restored relationships, a life where we become more and more smitten by God's love. Let us go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for saving us through your Son. We thank you for all the riches you have poured into our lives, making us holy at the cost of sending us your Son to die on our place. We confess that we have neglected to strive against the enemy. We confess that we have neglected your truth, that we have neglected the good news of salvation, and that we have neglected to live holy lives. Awaken us from our slumber, we pray. Awaken us from our idleness and our complacent faithfulness, faithlessness and denial of you. Lead us to repentance, that we may be freed from 
the enemy's hold over our lives, that we may freely and joyfully proclaim Christ to others in word and deed. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Let us receive God's blessings that comforts, affirms, and enables us to stand against the enemy. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.